So this summer, Sherry has started something that she has done before, but only back when we lived in Wisconsin. That was like seven years ago now. Uh, she is working on a garden where she plants actual seeds into the ground and waits, uh, and through a lot of care and effort, uh, hoping that they will grow and then eventually yield their fruit or their vegetable uh, for then us to eat. Um, back in Wisconsin, we started right before we moved, and we never were able to, to actually go through a full gardening season cycle. Uh, we prepared and cleared away and made a little garden bed, um, and I think we planted it, but we had also used a bunch of uh, like weed and grass killer to kind of clear it, um, so nothing really grew uh, <laughs> that first season. So just a little tip, if you're gardening, don't, don't kill it with fertilizer right before you plant it, because apparently that stuff stays in there. No, I mean, we're learning all sorts of things. Uh, this is kind of, well, Sherry, what she has in mind is she's going to plant a lot of different types of seeds in a lot of different areas, some pots, some actual garden beds, some just right in the ground, and we're just going to kind of see, right? We'll give it sun. There's different sun in different spots. Uh, we'll water it a ton, and we'll just kind of learn, well, what grows really well here? You know, she's read things online, talk with friends, talk with some of you guys about, well, what, what works around here. And she told me yesterday that she got her first uh, sugar snap pea. Um, and she plucked it off the plant and ate it. And she's like, yes, like it's working, you know, like, like it's actually happened. Because we were, we were concerned. I think we had a few strawberries grown, but I think we fed those to the local wildlife scene. Um, and so, you know, you got to learn like, well, how do I make sure that I'm the one who gets to, you know, enjoy the fruit of whatever we're producing? I have a very similar uh, parallel quest uh, in our yard, and that's just how to keep the, the yard green and not brown. Um, our front yard has a giant tree that shades the yard, and so the amount of water that we use keeps it very nice and green. Our backyard, however, does not have a tree, and there's a spot that never hit, gets shade from our house, and it is fried, you know? And it's like, okay, I need more water, but I also need more shade, but maybe I need a different kind of seed. Like, I'm looking into, like, hey, which grasses can just sit out in the sun all day? Uh, or maybe I need new soil or different soil or different fertilizer. There's all sorts of different ideas that I have uh, or different ways and strategies that I need to go in order to make this thing grow and not just uh, die every June. <laughs> um, I, I feel like I have a similar project here at church, right? I'm tasked with leading and growing the church. And, and you, come on, be honest with me. You haven't ever walked in here, looked around and said, you know what? There's some potential for growth here in this church. <laughs> That's a glass half full kind of view. You look around and it's like, wow, there could, man, there, this church could have more people in it. You know, like this could be like a little bit more of a thing. Uh, church growth strategy is a very popular topic. Uh, there's all sorts of books, podcasts, resources, uh, go to conferences and hear speakers uh, about well, what things can you do to help grow your church. Uh, there's various strategies and excellent ideas. You know, things like make sure you have a great children's ministry, make sure you're investing in leaders, make sure you're communicating with people. Um, and, and then, of course, everyone's got their product that will help you, you know, get, get to where you need to be. Um, but some of you are saying, well, hold, hold on, time out, Brad, time out. Church growth isn't just about numbers. There's something more to the church than just having a lot of people. You're absolutely right. And, and I feel like a lot of this church growth strategy that I've seen emphasizes, well, how can you get people and keep people here in your church? Uh, but the point of growing a church is making fruit, J just like my wife in her garden. Now, she can plant more seeds and have a ton of seeds in her backyard, but if they don't ever grow fruit, she doesn't have a garden, right? Like, like having, having a lot of fruit is good. But having a little fruit is better than no fruit. It doesn't matter how many people we have here if there's no growth, right? Growth is something different. It, it, numerical growth is good, but the growing of the church is something that we need to be aiming at, and we have to be looking, okay, well, what is this church growth strategy? Luckily for us, uh, we don't have to read books and podcasts and, and things. We have a church growth strategy right here within the Bible, and we're going to be reading it today, and I hope applying it to our own lives. Um, the task of growing the church is not just mine. I'm, I'm the only one who has a job, uh, since Kim is on vacation, the only one here today that has a job to help grow the church. Um, but you see in the Bible that it's definitely all of us working together to grow the church. We're going to be reading Ephesians chapter 4. 
So jump there if you've got it. Otherwise, uh, I think we're going to have it up on the screen uh, behind me. We're going to be verses 7 through 16. This is a letter that Paul wrote to a church or a group of churches in Ephesus, which is present-day Turkey. He says, But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. That little aside is Paul saying, no, this is Jesus Christ. We're talking about Jesus, the one who is here, who died, who resurrected, who ascended back into heaven. And he says, so Christ himself, in verse 11, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This is Paul talking about the church to this group of people um, where the first three chapters he's talked about everything Christ has done and how we have salvation, we have unity together. Now here in chapter 4, he looks closer at what does this thing look like, this body that we have that we're now a part of. It talks about, well, here is how we grow. Uh, Several times in there he talks about us growing in unity and maturity in Christ. We can view that as that fruit. That's the sugar snap P we're going for. Unity and maturity in Christ Jesus. That's the growth that we're looking for here within the church. And there's a little growth strategy. It's a a little two-step. Oh, turn turn the thing on. Gets me every time. There's a little growth strategy. It's two steps that I think is here out of that Ephesians chapter 4. All right, the first step is that let Jesus do his thing. (laughs) It starts with Jesus. That's how Paul starts the conversation about what church growth is. These are those first verses. He says, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. He's quoting a psalm uh, from the Old Testament and saying, uh, this is fulfilled with Jesus. When he ascended on high, now he sends spiritual blessings from God back to us. Uh, He's implying, especially in those next two verses about when he descended, then he ascended back. Everything that Christ has done uh, in order to die on the cross for our sins, in order to resurrect the offer of life for us, uh, that is all wrapped up in these gifts uh, that he is now giving to us. It starts with Jesus. Uh, The church is his, and he's the one giving gifts to make it grow. It's not anything that we're doing. We're not coming up with anything. The first step is Christ. And then it says the gifts, uh, at least as Paul mentions here, he says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Um, Paul uses different lists. So there's, there's kind of three separate places where Paul talks about what these gifts of the Spirit are. He calls them gifts of the Spirit in a letter to the Corinthians in chapter 12. Uh, here he just calls them gifts that Jesus uh, Christ has given, uh, and they look more like roles that, that particular people would play uh, in the life of the church. In other places, in that letter to the Corinthians, also he wrote a letter to the Romans, a church that he had never attended, never didn't know the people. He lists out specific uh, more tasks, and not so much roles, but uh, like, the, like prophesiers and helpers and servers and encouragers and leaders. Um, and so what we can tell from how Paul is talking about these gifts here is that gifts are some free gift that Jesus has given, some supernatural gift he's given, uh, and they, they have something to do with the different role that you play within the body of the church. Now, that's step one. That's the, the strategy of church growth is let Jesus do his thing, and he's already done it. If we are a follower of Jesus, we have these gifts. 
we have spiritual gifts here within the church right now. Step two is put the spiritual gifts to work. Here's how it ends that we read. From him, the whole body, that's all of us, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And so what we see is that we have these gifts and the church grows when we use these gifts. And again, the goal of this growth is this unity, this maturity, where we're connected together and we're more connected to Christ. We more reflect who Jesus is in the world if we're growing and if we're using these spiritual gifts that God has given us. Now, Whenever I've been taught about spiritual gifts, I've, I've definitely heard it more, uh, you have a list of gifts, and you've got one of them in you. Let's find out what it is. And so I've taken things called spiritual gift assessments. Uh, and that's, I think, something that's kind of common. It's kind of like a personality test, where you say, oh, I kind of like doing these things, or these things are kind of what I am. And then at the end, it says, oh, your spiritual gift is this. Okay, now go do it. Um, th- those aren't biblical. Now, they, I'm not saying they aren't helpful, uh, but that's, that's not in the Bible. Paul doesn't say, uh, and here's the process for determining what your spiritual gift is. Instead, it's talking more, much more, it, the Bible, um, and Paul in this case, is talking much more about there is this grace that has been given to you. There's a spirit that will empower you in certain ways. Use that. Uh, and I think it would be probably more helpful, especially if you've had that background of, I need to identify my gift and then use it, um, to understand what Peter says about gifts. So he wrote in First Peter also about gifts. Uh, it's not as popular of a teaching because he does not list individual gifts. I'm going to be First uh, Peter 4, 10 through 11. I've got it up on the screen here. This is what Peter says. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. I just love how, Paul puts the, or how Peter puts this, being faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. I like that as a conception of what is our role with the spiritual gift. So we have been given a special grace from God through his Holy Spirit. And now we are called to be faithful stewards. And it says in its various forms, which means that it's going to look different from each other, right? So, So even though we have the same spirit, we have been empowered in different ways. And so now how can we be faithful with how God has given us a gift? Uh... We celebrated my son's birthday this past week. He turned eight, and we, we kind of have special traditions around birthdays. One, uh, we blow up balloons, and we throw them on their bed and hope they wake up in the middle of the night. Uh, it's a bunch of you know, latex in their face. Um, not, not really, but that's just what always happens. Um, but we also put like streamers up, and we wrap the gifts the night before, and we place them uh, in a prominent place. Uh, this, this year is right in front of the fireplace downstairs, so that when they wake up, they go downstairs, they see the gifts, and then they pester us, can we open them, can we open them? Yes, of course you can open them. Um, this year, on the day of Quentin's birthday, he was going to go with, to his grandparents' house. And so we could have said, uh, well, not yet, we've got to get ready and then go, and then maybe we'll open them later. And maybe, maybe he would have let us get away with it. Or maybe we would have had to have him open one. But what if he came back, having not opened any of them in the morning, and we said, oh, sorry, it's getting late, uh, we'll have to do it tomorrow. Like, he wouldn't let us not open his gifts on his birthday. But what if we said no? Like, what if the gifts just stayed there, right? Like, no, 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 no. We had wrapped those gifts so that he would open them, so that he would use them, so that he would play with them. Uh, it's fun. I, I, uh, I bought some clothes for Quentin that I knew he would like, or I thought he would like. And you know how much joy it brought me? I bought him four shirts, and the next four days after his birthday, he wore each of the shirts in decreasing order of what his favorites were. It's like, yes, like I gave you those gifts. I want to see you put them to use. Like that was the purpose. Like we have gifts given to us for our church. It does no use to keep them under wraps. Like if we don't know or if we're not actively using our gift, we're essentially like the parent that's just leaving the gifts there and let our kids run around. No, no, open them up. Open them up. They're for you and they're for us. 
And here's the thing, unlike gifts, uh, like with um, Quentin's birthday, they aren't just meant for our enjoyment or our pleasure. It's, it's not, the spiritual gifts that we're talking about here are not gifts that make us feel good or, or make us feel like, ah, I'm well connected to God or I'm loved by him. They're gifts that are meant to bring unity and build up the church. And so we're doing each other a disservice when we're not actively understanding or trying to see what gift God has given us and letting God work it out through us. So that's what spiritual gifts are. Two st- Whoa, I hit three times. Normally I just hit twice. Biblical growth model, let Jesus do his thing. He starts it. He's the one who has already won our salvation, who's unified the church, brought us together, and then given us gifts through the Holy Spirit. And then our job, number one and number one. That's funny. I did not mean to do that. Put the spiritual gifts to work. So now that we have them, okay, now we go. Um, so, so that's basically spiritual gifts in a nutshell if we want to understand them from the top level. But the question we now have to ask ourselves is, okay, what about our church? What does this look like then for us here at Beyond Church? Especially if we see potential for growth, right? Okay, well, how do we apply this model to our church? Uh, here's the question that we can ask ourselves. Is our church what we are willing to make it? Right? So if we see that there's potential for growth, are we willing to put in the work and the effort and the desire to make it what we want? Uh, this sounds like a very inspirational question, but it's the wrong question to ask. Because this question says, I am the one who decides where our church is going, and I am the one who's going to determine how we get there. Um, I think one of the weaknesses of kind of church growth strategy is that it answers this question and gives tools so that I can read a book and say, ah, what we need to do is this, and then our church will grow. And I'm basing this off of, well, how much do I want to work? Am I willing to put an effort to make the church where it goes? But this is the question we're supposed to ask. Instead of, is our church what we are willing to make it, is our church what God wills to make it? Because if we're saying we have spiritual gifts given specifically to build up the church, that means God has an idea of who we are supposed to be as a church, as a body of believers. And he's waiting for us to unwrap those gifts in the same way that I have an idea of what I want my son to look like, so I buy him shirts to wear in the hope that he will open them up and wear them. Now, he can can wear, wear whatever he wants, but my intention was that he would use them. He would put them on. God has an idea of who we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to grow. And he's given each one of us gifts to get us there. And so if we're too busy asking ourselves that first question, that just grit our teeth and let's make it happen, you know, and I think a a lot of churches can probably fall into this. You know, it's like, well, I mean, we do need extra people to help out with the kids' classrooms. We do need people to help out with the sound and the slides. We do need musicians. You know, and so now it's, all right, well, we've got to work hard, and we've got to provide kind of the, the effort, the sweat, and then we'll be able to build a church. Well, that's the first question. What we really need is to say, okay, God, how have you equipped me? What gift have you given me? How can I give that back to the church? And it might come out in serving in the specific roles of the church, But are we allowing the Spirit to lead us and become the church God wants us to be, providing the fruit He wants, or are we simply going to create something uh, that we've created ourselves? And and here's the tough part. If we look at what, like a Sunday morning, everything that happens, you know, the people outside, people making the coffee, the teachers teaching the class, musicians, the sound people, slides, lights, me preaching, us praying together, is that a product of us bringing what we have and trying hard and effort in supporting the church? Or is that coming out of us submitting and letting the Spirit grow and develop the church? I I don't know. (laughs) Like, what, what would it look like if all of our roles were done in the Spirit versus done with our own effort? I don't know, the same? I mean, or would it be different? Right, like as if the Spirit is a spirit that brings life, then, then when we're serving, when we're participating in the church, when we're praying with each other, when we're going to community groups, is life happening in places where we're not even expecting it, where we're not even aiming for it, right? Is God's peace and his joy just coming because we're gathering together, because the spirit's working? Or does it look like, no, we're kind of creating it. You know, I made, made the little snacks, you know, and I'm kind of leading the conversation and we're only getting 
what we're putting into it. Like when we look around, like on, a, like on a Sunday, you'd see there'd be more joy, right? We talked about the fruit is unity and maturity in Christ. We would be more unified if we're serving in the Spirit. If we're coming to church in the Spirit, we're participating in the church in the Spirit. And, and to be honest, like what our church look so normal, you know, where, where it seems like we're getting what we're putting in. Um, like I don't doubt the sincerity of our faith. But I wonder how much are we coming to church in the Spirit and letting God work through us with the gifts He's given us versus us just kind of doing the things that we know we're supposed to do or that, that are needed to be done. That's the challenge because we're, me- we're meant to come to church with a supernatural power as opposed to just our best ideas for how to make things go. Uh, here's an example. Every week I prepare a sermon. That's my job. You guys have paid me uh, to come up, lead the church. And one of the things is I study the Bible. So I look at whatever topic or passage we had. I read texts. I read commentaries. I'll read theology textbooks. And I try to understand what the Bible's saying. Then I try to process, well, how do you guys need to hear this, right? What would be best for our church to hear so that when I stand up here on Sundays, I can give you the best that I have, the best that I think is in the Bible for you to hear. And is that good enough? Like, no. Because let's be, let's be honest, you aren't here to hear what Pastor Brad thinks. Right? You aren't here to hear what, what did you study? Did you discover any new nugget today? No. The reason you are here is because you want to hear from God. You want to be moved by God himself. The reason I'm here as a pastor is not because I just want to tell more people about what I think the Bible says. No, I want to be a vessel where God can speak through me, right? And so there's this wrestling match. Uh, Maybe that's a pessimistic way of saying it, but a balancing act where I'm going to provide all the effort I can and I'm going to study and learn and grow, but then I hope that I'm offering that up to God so that God would speak through me and it wouldn't be my ideas coming through. But every sermon probably has a little of both or a lot of both. You know, it, It's a mix. But my goal, my desire, my prayer is that my ideas would be down to complete elimination and that it would only be God that speaks through me, that it would be the Holy Spirit through this gift he's given me to preach, to teach, that he would use that and that he would speak to you through me. And it's that in every single one of the roles. So we have very spe- like specific roles, like a musician, right? Or a kid's leader, a teacher, a sound guy, whatever it is. Um, it's a wrestling match. You have to show up. You have to rehearse. You have to study the kid's lesson the night before. You know, and then you're going to bring your best effort. But the goal is not that you would move the church forward, but rather God would move through you and how he's gifted you to help move the church. That's our goal, and that's what I challenge all of us with. And here's, here's the way that I'm phrasing it kind of as a, a conclusion, is let the Spirit work your gift. right? Don't, don't keep it in your mind like, okay, well, I have this gift. I need to now discover it. Okay, it's a gift of encouragement. Okay, what, where's the encourager role here? You know, it's like, do you have encouragers? No, you don't have encouragers. Ah, oh, well, how do I do it? You know, I guess I'll be a greeter, you know? And so then you plug yourself in and you're like, okay, I've got to do this. No, 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 time out. God has given you a gift. Let it go and let the Spirit work in you. Maybe you aren't even doing a role. Maybe your role is to go around, talk with people. Maybe your role is to listen to people during the prayer time and then follow up with them later. Maybe you're going out to coffee with them later. But you have a gift of encouragement. Well, then encourage Do it well and do it through the Spirit. Not so much, I have to keep this thing going, but rather, God, how can you, through me, use this gift? Let the Spirit work your gift every Sunday when we come. I kind of, I want to go through how do we identify our gifts. Uh, Again, this isn't biblical, so... There's, there's no like appendix with like the spiritual gifts assessment or something like that that you get to take. Uh, when Paul writes about the gifts, he's, he kind of assumes that they already have them. Uh, the, the letter to Romans is great. In Romans chapter 12, he just kind of says, hey, we've all been given gifts, so use them uh, however God has given you grace to use it. If it's prophesy, if it's to prophesy, then prophesy. 
If it's uh, serving, then serve. If it's giving, then give. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's encouraging, then encourage. And he just kind of keeps going. But he just assumes they already know. These are people he's never met, right? So it's not like, he says to the Corinthians, you have every spiritual gift. Um, he knew them, but, but he just assumes, like, hey, if you're in the church, you, you kind of know your gift. So, so here's the encouragement I want to give you. At some level, the spiritual gifts are self-evident. You can tell, or other people can tell, what they are. And so if you're wondering, uh, what is my spiritual gift? Where has the Spirit moved in your life? Where have you seen life? Where have you seen growth? Where have you seen this unity, this maturity, this fruit? Okay, maybe that area or whatever it is that you were doing, maybe that's part of your spiritual gift. You can ask others as well. If other people can affirm, can see, hey, you're really good at, at teaching. You know, you should probably do that more and develop that. Yeah, that's a good indicator that that is a potential spiritual gift that God's given us. Uh, but, but here's the other thing. Uh, there's no list. Uh, there's several lists in the Bible, but they're all different. And even some things that we would say, oh, that's definitely a spiritual gift, aren't listed in here. Like musicians isn't a spiritual gift in the Bible. Or prayer isn't. There's no intercessory prayer that's listed in the Bible. Uh, I don't think there's specific, very narrow views or only like eight or a dozen spiritual gifts. Your gift might be encouragement, but it might be a different spiritual gift of encouragement that someone else has. And so we've got to understand, well, what does it look like for me? So a lot of that is prayer and trying it out. You know, if, if you're in a spot here in our church that you're participating well, whether it's a, a particular role or it's in a community group or you kind of know your role and you're seeing fruit develop, yes, keep, keep going. That is where God wants you to grow our church. If you're not feeling that or if you feel like you're kind of that first question where you're just gritting your teeth and you're getting through things, uh, well, maybe switch it up. You know, if you're not serving anywhere, try serving. There are various roles. We'd love to have uh, some of the people that are serving multiple times a month just serve once a month. And so just slotting you in once a month and, well, let me try teaching the kids, right? Well, let me try the soundboard. You know, let, let me try leading a community group because I don't know, but maybe God has a certain gift that he wants to use. And then be praying as you're going, is this where God has me? Do I see life? Do I see things where, where the Holy Spirit is moving? Okay, then let me lean in there. And my... My thought is it won't be a specific role within the church, like coffee team. That's probably not going to be your spiritual gift. There's going to be a way that you do the coffee team that's your spiritual gift. So be paying attention to how God is wanting you to participate in whatever role he has from you. But this is how we are going to grow as a church. When we're all living with this idea that the Spirit is working through us, I have something to offer, and okay, I want to. Like, we have to understand, God has a design for growth in our church. And if we aren't using our gift, then we're not growing the church where he wants it to go. Any growth we see is going to be maybe part his, part ours. Let's all use our gift and let God grow us. I want to end by uh, playing a little game. It's a, it's a game that I've, I've played before, uh, for sure. I just don't tell you that it's a game. It's a little game that I call... Uh, but what's the context? Uh, it's not really a game at all. It's just a question I ask. But it's when I look at like a, a verse, like a popular verse or some verse that's really encouraging that perhaps people use, and I ask, but what's the context? Because I feel that the Bible is, is, is coherent and it's, it's, it's one letter. It's all together. There's, it's not a snippet of a bunch of pithy phrases and you know, tweets that we're supposed to like post on our social media accounts. Uh, it's meant to encourage us in a certain direction. Uh, here's what I want to go today. It's, it's another letter from Paul to a young pastor, Timothy. It's actually the pastor of the church in Ephesus. He says this, and this is the popular one, the one that is Instagrammable. Uh, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. I mean, how encouraging is that? Right? Like we have the spirit, and that spirit does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self discipline. Yeah, definitely tweet that. But what's the context? Right? Like what was it that Paul saw in Timothy that made him concerned that, wait, you might be too timid? Right? Like, like clearly, Paul is wanting to encourage Timothy, right? It's you are not fully understanding the spirit that you have inside of you, the power, the love, the self discipline. You are going off. You're, you're, you're maybe too passive here. Do you want to know what it is? Paul's concerned Timothy isn't using his gift. 
He said in 1 Timothy that, that he received, Timothy received the gift of teaching the scriptures and preaching. And so he's commissioning him. And here's in his second letter. This is 2 Timothy that he's writing to him. He says, no, Timothy, I'm concerned. This is the verse right before verse 7. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through laying, the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. That for this reason, before we can play the game again, but what's the context? You can read in verse 5, he says, I know you have sincere faith. He talks about, I knew your, your mom, I knew your grandma. I know you have sincere faith. And for this reason, fan into flame the gift you have. Don't be timid. Don't just sit there. Like, it sounds like Paul thinks that Timothy is just going through the motions. He's the pastor. And yeah, maybe he's teaching or maybe he's doing something, but he's not understanding the power that his gift has. He's just passive. He's just allowing himself to come to every gathering and just kind of keep the status quo and leave. For all of us, don't be timid. The spirit God gave you was not one to just show up to church and leave and just be passive. No, fan into flame the gift God has given you. For others, you have sincere faith. That's not in question. What's in question is whether or not you're letting that flame grow and be the person God has gifted you to be. A special gift for you to share with others. So be encouraged. Don't be timid. Don't be fearful. You have the power, power to fan into flame the spiritual gift that God has given you in his grace for the growth of the church. Here's questions I've got where we can go further with this. Uh, the first one is, uh, what growth do you want in our church? Uh, you can be as, as honest as you want. We can talk super on a spiritual level about the unity and maturity in the faith or a very physical level, like I'd love to have donuts every Sunday or whatever it is. Uh, the second one is, what does working alongside God to grow the church look like for you? Here's what, here's what I mean by that question. Uh, I said it's like a wrestling act where I'm offering my best efforts, but I'm also wanting God to speak through me. Uh, I kind of shared that there's, uh, at least the worship team ahead of time, there's kind of two different ditches on either side of this road. One ditch says, um, I'm waiting for God to grow this church. And so I'm sitting here and once God moves or once God touches me and once God you know, reveals to me what my gift is, then I will get up and I will work. And so you're just waiting on God. Uh, that's not good. You kind of need to be both. Uh, but then you can go to the other side where you're saying, well, I know we have to do this, so here we go. We're going to build up a leadership track, and we're going to help work everything together. And you kind of forget the fact that, no, no, this whole growth plan starts with God first, and then we come alongside. What does that partnership look like where I'm offering what I have, but I'm also relying on God and his spiritual gifts? And then the last one, what spiritual gift has God given you? Uh, let this be a conversation. If there's others around you, if you're doing this in a community group or in your family, what do they affirm? What do they see? Um, maybe it's not a specific role, but maybe it's a, sp a specific type of role. Like one of, the, one of the gifts that Paul mentions is the gift of helping. You know, you're like, okay, like, what do you mean? Like helping? Is, well, yeah, that's more of a spirit of how you're going to go about whatever it is that you're a part of. So I challenge us all. Let's consider our spiritual gifts, offer them before God, and let the Spirit Work through them. Would you pray with me this morning by your hearts and heads? God, thank you so much that you've given us gifts. Thank you that you want us to participate in the growth of the church and the health of the church. Lord, we want to see life here. We, we recognize that there's potential for growth here in the church. But Lord, I pray that it would be your fruit that comes of it. And I pray that we would look for it, that we would water that we would uh, provide shade, that we would provide fertilizer in order that you might bring your growth here, God. We offer you our gifts. And I pray you help us identify them and try them. Uh, meet us in our offering to you and your faithfulness so that you can work out the church that you want to be here as we step forward in faith with whatever gifts you have given us, God. We thank you. We love you. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. All right, I invite you all. We're